Rabbi Zilberg, for uh, inviting me to speak here tonight. Uh, last year we spoke about Lithuania. This, week, this year we're going to please God speak about Poland and Belarus. And I know that all over the world tonight people are looking at different aspects of Jewish history. Uh, Rabbi Zilberg certainly gave us the angle that I think one has to delve into, and that is to take out of Tisha B'Av interpersonal messages. How do we relate to the world? How do we relate to our fellow man? Why is it that the third base of Mikdash hasn't been built in our day? That's certainly the core and the heart of the day. But I think all over the world today, people are also looking at different angles of Tisha B'Av because we know that Tisha B'Av comes at the end of the three weeks and it comes in a time astrologically when we have been beset by tragedies for thousands of years since the Meraglim came back in the times of the Chumash with a bad report about Eretz Israel. And since then we've seen throughout Jewish history the expulsion from Spain and many other tragedies that have happened at this time. And if one looks at the Holocaust, one sees also that at this particular time of the year, the three weeks, was a time when many thousands and indeed hundreds of thousands of Jews were murdered. And so, for me, I look at history as a window into the world and the eyes of Hashem Himself. Because by looking back at history, we understand where we are, where we live, who we are relative to where we've come from. And I honestly believe that the fact that each of us are sitting here tonight as observant Jews, as caring Jews, as committed Jews, and thank God that there are millions of other Jews joining us all over the world, each of us is a living miracle and testimony to the unbelievable character of the Jew and our relationship to Hashem Himself. We are, we are survivors. Every person here, sitting here, is a survivor in my, by my definition. Because I believe that if it wasn't the decision of a forebear, somebody in our family, that decided to leave Europe, none of us would be sitting here tonight. Just to look at a couple of numbers. How many Jews were living in Europe at the time of the Holocaust, when the Nazis, when the Nazis, the Mashman, rose to power? How many Jews were in Europe? First of all, how many Jews were there in the world in 1940? So they say that there were about 17 million Jews in the world just before the Holocaust. There were 9 million Jews living in Europe. What we're looking at tonight is the fact that two-thirds of European Jewry were murdered from somewhere between 1939-1940 and 1944 going into 45. In a period of about four years we lost two in three Jews that were walking the streets of Europe and we lost one in three Jews in the entire world across the planet. We are only 80 years away from the Holocaust. That means that all of us are still within the epoch, within the time period of one of the greatest disasters that the world has ever seen and surely for the Jewish people one of the greatest disasters that ever happened to us as a people. And I think it's so important that from time to time in Tisha B'Av is such an appropriate moment to look back and to see what we've lost. That's important. To see also the remarkable, indomitable spirit of the Jew. That no matter what we've been through, no matter what trials and tribulations we've been through, that we've not only survived, we've not only made a disproportionate contribution to the world, but we have preserved a precious heritage that actually makes us something different, something special. I've said previously that it's quite a remarkable thing to think that the Jewish people we talk about our four mothers, Sarah, Rif, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Three of them didn't have wounds. Three of them couldn't conceive and have children. But through tefillah, they raised themselves above nature. And we, in fact, come from women that we infer from. And therein, I believe, is one of the secrets in this universe. 
that the Jews are in the level of eight in Kabbalistic terms. We're above nature. Nature is the world of seven. We're in the world of eight. And there is no one on earth that can claim the kind of history that we do. And that precious heritage is what this is all about. And passing it on to the next generation. So let's have a look here. In Poland and Belarus, two central communities in Eastern Europe. And this is Poland. If we can maybe just switch off the lights at this point, I think Rabbi Zulbuk's gone out. But just to contextualize it, thank you very much. We see here's Poland, here's Warsaw, and our travels in this particular tour, and this particular trip that I did was in 1996, and it was really the origin of the entire journey that I've taken in the last 22 years. There were 30 of us that were chosen from about eight countries in the world by the Jewish agency to understand what has happened in Jewish history so that we can come back to our communities and we can educate our communities and inspire our communities. And this particular trip that I did was the very, very first and has inspired me and I continue that journey today. First to the Jewish agency, afterwards at the World Mizrahi, and more recently I was asked to be a scholar in residence for Eddish Kosher Travels, which is another forum for me to inspire people about Jewish history, Jewish society, and the Jewish people themselves. So we went to Warsaw, we went down to Radom, and then we went to Auschwitz, which is just a little bit further south. And you can see some famous um, names of places, Bialystok, Pinsk, Krakow, Krakow, where Schindler's List was formed, and we're going to also talk tonight about Minsk because we traveled from Poland, we went across to Minsk. Here's the Thuane on the top, Shalai, Shovel, Kovna, and look at this, this is interesting. Can you see where is Vilna? Vilna's in Poland here, am I right? So where was Vilna, in Poland or Lithuania? It was in both. Because Vilna sometimes was occupied by the Poles and the border moved and other times it was in Lithuania. But this is really, this part of here, Lithuania and Belarus was really called Greater Lithuania and you've got Poland in the middle there. Any idea how many Jews lived in Poland just before the Holocaust? Three million. Yeah. Three million. Approximately 3.3 million. They say 3 million, but I think the more reliable statistic is about 3.3 million. Any idea how many Jews lived in Lithuania before the war? 200,000. About 240,000. So you can see that the Lithuanian Jewish community and about 90% of us sitting here tonight are from Lithuania. They, that was a small community of about 240,000 and the Jews of the, of, the, of the Belarus, which is along this border over here, Poland, which is where I said we're going to go tonight as well, also about 240,000 Jews, 3.3 million Jews in Poland. And this is just some of the statistics, this is in 1933, so that's a number of years before. But just to give you an understanding, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union had about 2.5 million Jews, Poland in 1933 had around about 3 million, At Latvia 95,000, Lithuania, it was actually 240,000 before the war, but you can see the numbers over here. Spain, Portugal, very small community. Austria, you see here, this is the greatest concentration of Jews here in Central and Eastern Europe. And we've got the smaller communities here in the Baltics. Let's have a look at Polish Jewry in the Middle Ages just to contextualize it. Whenever I speak, I try and give people a history right from the beginning of the community until the present day. So the Polish Jews in the Middle Ages in 1170 Warsaw, the Jews administered the Polish mint, and many coins had Hebrew inscriptions. So the Jews lived in Poland approximately a thousand years, the Jews lived in Lithuania for approximately 600 years. From 1333 to 1370, Kazimierz the Great issued a series of charters protecting the Jews. And this is something that you see when I speak about Portugal and I speak about Spain, you see the same thing. That there's initially a golden age, a golden period of Jewish history, and then unfortunately, inevitably, it turns. So this here is all during the golden age of Pol Polish Jewry. 1356, Jews were granted autonomy in their communal affairs. Also, a very happy state for the Jews to be, where we can run our own government and be almost self-governing in a foreign country. 1388 to 1390, the Grand Duke of Vitov grants privileges to the Jews and protects them. Once again, throughout Europe, we've seen times when there have been very... Uh, there have been leaders, Gentile leaders, that have been very good to the Jews and given them protection. 
1399, the first persecution of Jews in Poland begins. This is once again that flip, that turn. 1407, anti-Jewish riots in Krakow. 1494, Jews restricted to the Kazimierz, that's in Krakow, a suburb of Krakow in the first Jewish ghetto. 1494, that's about 500 years ago, roughly. Now we jump ahead to Poland during the 20th century. To give an overview in the 20th century, 1939, September the 1st, Germany invades Poland and World War II begins. The Polish army was absolutely crushed in a short time. And that also is an amazing testimony to the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto that managed to hold off the Nazi army for about six or seven weeks, and that was the entire Nazi army. And over here they just overran the country in a very much shorter time. The SS and the German army cooperated widespread pogroms, pogroms and mass executions in Poland. The 21st of September 1939, Heydrich issues directives to establish ghettos in German-occupied Poland. September the 27th, 1939, forced labor announced for Polish Jews. April the 19th, 1943, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising begins as Germans attempt to liquidate 70,000 inhabitants. Jewish underground fights the Nazis until early June, and they fought them with Molotov cocktails, which were really bombs that had petrol inside of them with some primitive sort of wick, and they had managed to sm smuggle some gun guns into the, into the ghetto. These were young people, teenagers and people in their 20s mainly that were the fighters. And they, were, they actually were very successful. They killed a number of Nazis that came in uh, in an ordinary way with, uh, as, as soldiers coming in, and because of the amount of, of German casualties, the Germans then decided that they're not going to try and come in on a one-to-one on -one combat level, but they just decided to bomb the place from the top and just mortared it and literally flattened the whole of the Warsaw Ghetto. They were too scared to actually enter into the ghetto and fight one-to-one. Uh, -one. January 11, 1945, the Soviet troops take Warsaw, and as we know, it was due to the Soviets that the Nazis actually met their end, because Hitler, your Russian was a fraud, tried to bite off too much and he tried to invade Russia. And, uh, and that was the end of, uh, thank God, the end of the Nazis. August the 15th, 1945, World War II ends, and Russia annexes Poland, and Poland becomes part of the Soviet Union, as was Lithuania, as was Belarus. And in 1989, the Third Polish Republic, they got the independence from the Soviet Union in 1989. So let's have a look here uh, at Poland. This is, this is now Warsaw in the, in the 1930s. It's Photograph that I got from the machine, just to give one an idea of some of the old buildings. And what's quite amazing is that there are still a number of these buildings there today. Most of Warsaw was destroyed in the Second World War, but there were a number of buildings that survived. And it's quite an eerie thing to actually see some of those old buildings, and you're actually looking at the buildings that the Jews were living in and working in and uh, lived amongst when they were there. And this is a typical street scene over here, 1937, the Jewish stores in Warsaw, Poland. And once again, you see some very similar building, similar architecture, still to that standing to this day. And that, to me, was one of the most incredible things about this trip to Poland and then subsequent trips to Eastern Europe. And that is that, I think for all of us, we've really been, I think, I, I think that as a rule, Jews have been, in particular in South Africa, I think, well educated about the Holocaust, and many of us have had an opportunity to talk to survivors, to talk to people in our family. And by the way, I can just say in brackets, that there are many people that regret that they were unable to speak to grandparents or parents uh, when they had the opportunity. Sometimes it was because the parent or grandparent didn't want to speak about it. And uh, it, it's, it's a conversation in itself. But I think we've been quite well educated about the Holocaust. But I think, for me, when you walk on those streets, you actually feel the energy of the place when you see the buildings. When we walked into Auschwitz, the concentration camp, you know that all that, we all know what it looks like, that I bite my fry, and you walk through those gates and you walk into the barracks. It's something indescribable. And it affected me so deeply, and so many people on our trip as well, that when I came back, my therapy was actually sitting at the Biafra Library and just reading for hours, and that reading and that research has never stopped. Uh, and I guess that that was the aim of, of taking people there. So I understand that heritage travel, and particularly the, I've heard that there are a lot of people that don't want to go to Poland, that don't want to go to Lithuania, because it represents death and destruction. But I think that on the other side, if it's, if it's an opportunity to really be inspired, first of all for me to go back as a practicing Jew, I believe that that's my revenge. That the Jews that were there, that are buried there, 
should know that the Jews doubling on the top, walking, and, and, and walking as proud Jews in that country, for me that in itself is, is a kind of a revenge. Um, and also that we should be able to come away from these experiences inspired with greater devotion and greater inspiration in our daily lives as Jews. German troops parade through Warsaw after the surrender of Poland. This is in 1939. Those famous jackboots, or infamous jackboots. The most sophisticated and cultured people on earth became, as we know, savages that the world has never seen before. And this is some of the Soviet architecture, because I told you that Warsaw was raised to the ground. Um, and the Soviets soon built these massive places where they could show their might and had military parades. So this is the kind of architecture that I found there uh, in 1996, and some of it still exists. The Nozik Shul of Warsaw, Poland was the only shul. There were about, I think, 500 shuls uh, in Warsaw, probably even more, but in central Warsaw. This was the only one that survived the war because the Nazis, the Marshallman, used to use it as a stable for their horses. But thank God we, we still have the shul and it has been restored. And we were able to actually dive in here in a Tumignonim, the chief rabbi of, uh, of Poland, Michael Shugrit. And this was the uh, minion that we had over there. Uh, you can see that some of the, the photography over here is a little bit compromised because when I came back in 96, I was using the old style slide projectors. <coughs> which many people would not be familiar with, there's some that would be, and they were converted from those original early slides. But I'm very grateful that uh, Hashem put it in my mind not to just take an ordinary camera, but to take slide film in, in those days, they used to call it, uh, so that I could actually show it uh, to people. And my talking circuit really began in 96, uh, sharing all these stories and insights and history. And obviously it's evolved over the years as I've learned more and picked up more. Now this part over here was a part of Warsaw that was completely erased but was restored from photographs by the Polish government with the old original architecture of Warsaw. And this over here is a memorial to King Sigismund I and he represented one of those benevolent leaders that we were talking about before that was good to the Jews. And this, this was really during the golden age of, of, of Polish Jewry and King Sigismund used his own cavalry, his own horses, etc. for the inauguration of the Ramor from Moshe Isilis, who was, as we know, the Mechaber of the Shulchan Aruch for the Ashkenazim uh, in Poland. And this is a photograph that I took of the map that our guide was using uh, in Warsaw. And this over here, this area here, is the Warsaw Ghetto. And over here is, what is, a, is a place where the railway line, where people used to get onto the the carriages of, of the railways, they were lined up here, by, often by the Jewish police, unfortunately. Um, I don't think that there was ever one religious Jewish policeman, or kappa, uh, as they used to call them in the concentration camps. But there were certain people that were enlisted, and they had to make sure there was, of course, the Judenrat. The Judenrat was a, a, a Jewish appointed body uh, by the Nazis in order to administer the Jews in the ghetto, and they were given a quotas each day how many Jews had to be at the railway siding, and there was the line going to Trebunka. Photograph of the deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto to Trebunka by train, and this is that, those three lines that I showed you in that earlier slide, this is the Umschlagplatz, as you can hear, it's a German word, where 100,000 Jews from Warsaw were deported to Trebunka, and altogether a million people were murdered in that particular concentration camp. Two and a half million people were murdered in Auschwitz. Between two and two and a half million. And you know, it's so difficult for us to even contemplate these numbers, and that's why I try and stay away from numbers, because it's so impersonal. And that's why I try to bring the anecdotes and, and, and flesh out and put, put faces to these, to these numbers, so that we can begin to appreciate uh, what an enormous tragedy we suffered. And this is over here in Treblinka, uh, a memorial to the Jews. And that over here is one of the original walls that was built by Jewish slave labor in the Warsaw Ghetto. That's the wall as it was then. And there were three phases in the Holocaust. Uh, the first stage was isolation and that already started in the late 1930s where Jews lost their positions at work. They were at the university, they could no longer hold positions uh, of authority in, in, in politics, in, in, in all areas of leadership, in business as well, or professions. 
Then there was ghettoization, where at a certain point in time, the Jews were told that they've got to move all their possessions and they've got to move themselves and their families into very small areas, like we saw the Warsaw Ghetto. And then finally, elimination was from the Umschlagplatz to various places of mass execution. And there were a million children that were murdered in the Holocaust. And this is in the Warsaw Cemetery, and this is a little memorial over here to those million children, and there are photographs over here of some of the children. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, this is uh, a memorial in the actual place, in the, in, in the ghetto itself, in what was the Warsaw Ghetto. And it really celebrates Mordechai Nilevich, who's represented by this figure over here. This is Mordechai Nilevich. Uh, he was in 19, he was born in 1919 and he died in 1943. So that means he was about 24 years old when he led the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So it was young men like this that led that tremendous uh, attack uh, on, the, on, the, on the Nazis. And the uprising was from the, 8th, uh, the 19th of April until the 16th of May 1943. The sculptor of Tun Rappaport actually got this rock from the Nazis, it's called Labradorite, this particular kind of stone, and it was ordered by Hitler to build a monument to the victory that he assumed he would have once he had wiped out the Russians and taken over the whole of Europe. But thank God he was destroyed, and they used that very Labradorite to build this memorial uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. There is a replica at the Vashem in Jerusalem. And uh, you can see there were 13,000 uh, Jews that were killed by the Nazis in this particular uprising. There was a tremendous debate that happened before the uprising took place. There was a moral debate as to whether some Jews can rise up against the Nazis, which would cause the inevitable death of everybody else in the ghetto. You know, some people said it was a sophic, you didn't know if you were definitely going to die by being in the ghetto. I think many might argue and say they were definitely going to die because they were going to be on that Umschlagplatz and take it to a place of next execution. But on the other side, they were saying that if you cause this kind of rebellion and, and the Nazis are going to attack and they're going to wipe out the ghetto, then there's certain death for everybody. But at the end of the day, a decision was taken that they would, do, that they would um, rise up and, and this is what happened. This is the historic fact. And this is on the reverse side of that uh, stone, that Labradorite stone. And you can see over here the artist bringing out the fact that you have the Jew holding his Torah, looking up to Shemaim, that connection with Hashem, no matter what the circumstances, the Jewish spirit was left unbroken. And so we've looked now at, it, at one of the examples, and there were a number of examples where Jews rose up physically. I just want to say that each of these topics that I'm touching on can take literally hours of discussion and I want you to forgive me, uh, we're keeping it, we're going to try and keep it to an hour tonight because I know it's not comfortable for people to sit. But we can talk about each and every one of these aspects for hours. But, you know, one of the questions, and I'll, I'll just raise it quickly and answer it quickly. Why is it that there was not enough physical rebellion against the Nazis? And I just want to give you one example. And it's not giving the full answer, but just part of it. If a man has been stripped of his job for several years, he, can't, he hasn't got a passport that will let him out of the country. He's walking along the pavement with his wife and his children. He, next to him are men with automatic weapons, with dogs, with infantry, and with an entire military behind him. How on earth do you expect people under those circumstances to rise up against these Nazi, Nazi persecutors? What I'm saying is you can ex extend this example. It's, it's all very well saying, but why did the Jews fight back? But when you're looking under circumstances where already it's a process that had taken several years to get to where they were. Often they were already starving. They, they didn't know where they were. Even if you would, if that, if that man would have grabbed the, so the soldier next to him and grabbed his gun or what, they'd done whatever he did, it was certain death for his wife and children. And then where did you go? Where does this group of Jews go, even if they would have killed all the Nazis around them? So what I'm saying is, is that it's just, one has to look at the detail, the finer detail, to understand that they were, no, they were no different to what we would be today. And that's what I say. How differently would we react in a situation like that? It would be no different. They didn't want to go like lambs to be slaughtered. That's, uh, that's why I say, chas v'shonen, that anybody should ever use the phrase, like lambs to the slaughter, it's an insult and it's simply not the truth. 
These were people that were doing the best that they could under those circumstances. Where they could, where they could escape into the forests, and even in the forests it was almost impossible to do. They became partisans. But there was another door that was open to Jews. And that was spiritual resistance. Well, let's look at the physical resistance first. So here's an example of the Jewish partisans entering the liberated city of Vilna in, in, in July 1944. Despite overwhelming obstacles, scholars believe that 20 to 30,000 Jews participated in partisan units in the forests where they carried out daring raids and rescue operations. Members of the United Partisan Organization, FPO, took part in the liberation of Vilna by the Soviet army. And then there was spiritual resistance. And this is something I think which all of us can relate to as well. The indomitable Jewish spirit could not be subdued by the nightmarish torments of hell that was the Warsaw Ghetto. Contrasted by the depraved character of the German oppressors, Jewish unselfishness and morality shone all the more brightly. We couldn't control our physical uh, circumstances. That was completely overrun by people that were oppressing us and that had locked the place up virtually. But what we did have was how did we behave as people, which is what Rabbi Zulberg was talking about earlier. That which we can control is our response to our environment, our interpersonal relationships. People living on the brink of starvation organized trade schools, maintained underground classes and seminaries for students, wrote books, published newspapers and collected Torah scrolls and holy books for safekeeping. Above all, the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto kept the Yiddish kite with utter self-sacrifice. There was a young boy who wrote a book of Shilas that were asked during the Holocaust. His teeth had been kicked out by a German guard because he was looking for scraps of, of potato in Warsaw to bring back to the Warsaw Ghetto. And a Nazi guard had found him and kicked out his teeth. And he went to ask his Rebbe if, look, he's a, he was a Chosid, and Chosidim can't eat the broths which is when you mix uh, liquid, when you put liquid with, with matzah. And he wanted to know, because he couldn't chew the matzah, would it be okay, although he has a, a minhag in his family not to eat the broths, if he could eat the broths on, on Pesach that particular year. That's the level of a shaman. Not why my teeth were kicked out, but can I break the family traditions, not a lot of to observe Hashem's Torah. In spite of the prohibition against any prayer meetings, they maintained daily minyoni, held classes in Torah and Talmud, and meticulously observed the mitzvahs. There was even a group of young Torah scholars who steadfastly refused to shave their beards and cut their bales, risking their lives every moment of the day. As we know, a Jew only has to give his life or her life for three things, as we know, the three cardinal sins, murder, uh, sexual immorality, and idolatry. But it says also in Hadotha that Bashas Hashmat, that in a time of destruction, even things which are not those three, if you're going to cause a Kiddush Hashem by dying, then you should even put yourself at risk. And that's what these guys did. They kept on their beards and their pairs, even though they knew that they might be killed for doing something like that. The Jewish police, who played a shameful role during the Holocaust, were without exception assimilated Jews. They didn't understand the concept of And this is from a book that I read called Glimpses of Jewish Warsaw by Rabbi Yossi Al-Fassi. We then went through Radom, uh, the town of Radom, and the reason I took these pictures is that in many of the old towns, and as you remember last year, for those that came to hear me speaking about uh, Lithuania, and I know that there are a number of people in the audience tonight here that came with me to Lithuania, and we had an, an incredibly moving uh, trip, we actually went into some of the shtetlach, and it's amazing. It's like going back in a time capsule because you literally see the streets and the buildings where the people live. Just also thank you to Dr. Lindsay Glassman for filming tonight and always putting me on YouTube. I really appreciate it. He was with us in the area. And now we look at why, why was it Auschwitz? Why, why was it that, that so many people, the, the figures range between anywhere between one and a half to two and a half million Jews, two to two and a half million. It's a huge number. The exact number doesn't concern us right now. But why was Auschwitz chosen as the biggest death camp in Eastern Europe? So have a look. Auschwitz was basically the center of a whole network of railway systems. So a Jew could be put on a railway line in The Hague, for example, in Brussels, in Prague, in Berlin, in Kovna, Lomja, that's the, the town that we're in over now, Lublin, Budapest, Belgrade. So literally, you have over here a system of railways that the Nazis, and this was part of that genius, 
that they used existing infrastructure in each of the places to maximize using their technology, their, their technology and their, their genius for organization. They used all of it against the Jews, and that's why it was Auschwitz where most of the murders took place. The entrance, Albeit Mach Prime. Auschwitz actually was a, an existing town called, called Uschwinzien, and it was a Polish town. In fact, my wife's grandmother was, was born in Uschwinzien when it was still under Polish rule. And there was a military barracks in Uschwinzien, and the Germans gave it the name of Auschwitz, and then they built. On, if, if it was a single story building, they made a, a building, they made it a triple story, and that's when they put the double bar wire right around, etc. So it was a, once again, as I've just said, an example of where the Germans used existing infrastructure uh, for their own purposes. And of course, once again, I write Macht Frei, just to touch on a point that we can dwell on for a long time, but the deception. You see, the, the German Nazi wasn't only about infrastructure, it wasn't only about engineering. They understood the head of the Jew as well. And they used one of our greatest strengths and turned it, so to speak, into weakness, if you can call it that. The Jew, I believe, is one of the most optimistic people on earth. The Jew always believes in a future. We sit on Tisha B'Av, yet we call it a moy. It's a kind of a yontem. We don't say tachan. Even in the depths of our despair, we still see the positive. Tisha B'Av one day will be a daughter. That's the Jewish spirit. We don't get sucked in and totally dwell in that misery. That's the eternal optimism that I talk about, the eternal optimism of a Jew. So what do they do? They sold us a lie. They said to that man that was walking with his wife and his kids down the street in Warsaw, surrounded by Nazis, Yonachshanah. They didn't say we're taking you to a gas chamber. They said we're relocating you. When the Jews got on at the Umschlagplatz to go to Treblinka, they told that they were being transferred elsewhere. There were fake contracts that were given to people in the ghettos where they bought businesses. It had a double reason. Number one, they extracted diamonds and jewels and the last bit of money that the Jews had because they would pay for the, for the ability to have those contracts because they were going to be settled in the East. And the second thing was that it would stop the man from rebelling. Why would you want to kill the Nazi God next to you if there's a chance that you and your children and your wife, you've just signed a contract, will be moved to the east to live elsewhere and you have a contract to show it? That was that German genius, that evil genius. And this was also, Arbeit macht frei. All we want is your labor. And then you will be free. They never said, you're on your way to your bed. Just giving you layer after layer of reasons that will make you, I hope, look at it in a lot more depth and without the superficiality that a lot of people look at these, these issues with. Part of the deception. You walked into Auschwitz, you were greeted by a, an orchestra. Jewish musicians were playing music, violins. Percussion, an orchestra. In 1941, I saw this very building. As you walk in the gate of Auschwitz, on the right-hand side was this building, and in front of it, they showed us where the orchestra was. And you see groups of people, as you walk in, you see groups of people being marched out to work, and you say, where are they going? They're going out to work, and they'll come back at night. The deception didn't end. How did they bring the gas into Auschwitz? in Red Cross ambulances. Nobody was panicked. It's work as usual. This is a work camp. But the work camp was surrounded by double electric fences. And as I said earlier, it was Auschwitz was a former Polish army barracks. And we were there in the, it, it was towards the, it was just the beginning of winter, but you can see how bare the, the, the trees are, and that sense of foreboding and death just hangs over the place. Talasim of the prisoners of Auschwitz. Shoes. And look at this pair of sneakers over here, running shoes. 
And that also was a shock to me. I didn't expect to see shoes like we wear sports shoes today. They were wearing sports shoes as well in those days. Look at the colours. That was a victim that died in our shoes. And that's when it re I realised that it wasn't a long time ago. We're still living in that epoch. We're still living in that generation. More shoes. The canisters, the Zyklone B canisters, brought in by those ambulances. People were told they were going for a shower. Please undress, please pack your clothes nicely and leave them in a place that you'll be able to find them when you come out of the shower. The deception did not end until the door was locked and they were in the shower was never to come out. Alain, one of the guys that was with us on our tour, he uh, asked if he could go to Barracks 19 and afterwards we, we heard that Bar Barracks 19 was where his father was in Auschwitz and thank God survived and went to Belgium and had Alain. So it was fantastic that we had actually the son of a survivor that was with us uh, representing that hope and that future. And here's uh, the next to, next to Auschwitz. Does anybody know what, what the camp was next to Auschwitz? Birkenau. So this is the entrance to Birkenau. Once again, look at the deception. This was built by the Nazis. This is like a Hollywood set. This wasn't a station. It was the end of the line, but instead of the railway line just ending, they created an optical illusion that made it look like this was a station, but those railway lines were going to carry on. But when they stopped the train, it was just on the other side of this building, and they built the railway line just long enough so that the, when the human eye looked down the train, looked down the, the, the rails, it looked like it was going on indefinitely, but we walked to the end and saw that it ended. The deception even in Birkenau. And that's what it looks like today. That's the photograph we used for the poster for tonight. Selection. The deception continues. They have a doctor. Anybody remember his name? Mengele. Mengele. A doctor that took the Hippocratic Oath. Selecting out those people that would be good for the labor force and those people that were not good. So they would go immediately to the gas chambers and the ones that were fit enough to work would go to the other barracks in Birkenau where they would survive maybe some a few weeks, some a few months. Very rarely a person survived more than a couple of months, but there were some people that survived Birkenau. In the barracks, six people lying on a bank full of lice, starving, etc. And when we went in, this was one of the, the guys in our on, on our trip, unfortunately he passed away last year, a colleague of mine, Owen Blomberg, the late Owen Blomberg. So he had a friendship with a chap by the name of Ruben Ziegelboim, who was a Jew that lived in Kilani. And his brother was Shmuel Ziegelboim. Shmuel Ziegelboim was involved in Yiddish theatre in Warsaw. And the reason that I'm bringing in this particular anecdote is that <coughs> Ruben Ziegelboim, I actually went to have coffee with him and I met him uh, after we got back from this trip. He, Owen made the connection with me. And he said that his brother Shmuel Zingelbein was actually, he, he was smuggled out of, of Poland, out of Warsaw, and he went to England to try and tell the people what was going on in Poland. That it was just before the Nazis came in and he was trying to warn people, do whatever you can, let's try and get the English government, let's try and get the American government to intervene. He had parlor evenings. They tried to set him up with, with government people. Nobody believed him. Jews found it hard to believe that what Shmuel Ziegelbein was saying was the truth. He tried to create some awareness. He had a foreboding and he said, please, intervene. Nobody listened to him. So he went to his hotel room and he wrote a suicide note and he said, if you think that I wasn't being serious about how bad things are, and if you think that the destruction of the Jews is not coming imminently, maybe if I take my life, you'll take my message seriously. And he took his life in a London hotel. Here's a model of the crematorium. Remember I said earlier that they were told to take off their clothes. So this is, there was steps and we actually, we walked across the grass verge on the top. Once again, green grass and trees. 
and then you'll see a couple of stairs going down. There's an underground room over here where Jews were told to take off their clothes and to pack them so that they remember where they, where they are when they come out. And then they were told to go in to have a shower. As we know, it was the Zyklon B that was put in through these openings at the top over here. And then afterwards, Jewish prisoners would take the bodies because there was no way out. They, once those doors were locked, they were hermetically sealed in there. Then they would take the bodies up into the crematory at the top. And then there were the Jews that were the slave laborers that were at the top over here, uh, working a day and night uh, in the crematorium. And many of them were Greek Jews that were kept separately from the rest of the Greek Jews. And I, when I do the, my talk on Greece, we, we talk about uh, the Zonda commandos. Many uh, of the Greek guys were very strong. They were stevedores. They worked in the harbor in Thessaloniki. Many of them were boxers from Maccabi. And uh, because of their physical strength, they were used as the Zonda commandos to push the bodies into the crematoria. In the crematoria. And thank God, at a certain point, the Allies did wake up, they didn't listen to Shmuel Ziegelbein, but uh, eventually they did wake up to what was going on. After just saying that it's a purely internal affair and they're not getting involved, they did, and they, they bombed, the Allies did bomb the concentration camps. There was also, by the way, an, an incredible uprising of those Jewish Zonda commandos, those, the Greek guys. There was also a rebellion where they managed to smuggle in pieces of dynamite and blow up one of the crematoria and kill a number of Nazis as well. And this over here is... Um, a memorial to the Jews of Auschwitz with human bone uh, that was collected from the crematoria in this glass at the top. And then we move out of the Holocaust and have a look at Poland and that beautiful heritage that I was speaking to you about before. So that now that you've seen the destruction, let's understand what was destroyed in Poland. So this over here is a plaque outside the shul in Krakow. And this is the Ramoshul, Ramoshul Yisavis, as I said, he wrote the Ashkenazi version of the Shulchan Aruch that was written, written by Rabbi Yosef Kara, he wrote with the Ashkenazi tradition changes. It is our tradition that on this place, Ahmad Haramozatzal, Ramoshul Yisavis, of lesser memory, to pray, and to express his heart to Hashem, one of the great giants of Poland and of Jewish history in Poland. And this is inside the Ramor Shul. His father was a wealthy man and said, I don't want to build you a wooden shul because they would often burn down. So it was made of stone and it was made so well that here it is after several centuries still standing. This, by the way, is the plaque on the wall. The grave of Ramor Shul the chief grave of Krakow. And who was he? He lived from 1525 to 1572, born in Krakow. And he was known as the Ramba, the Maimonides of Polish Jewry. He codexed he encoded and indexed Jewish law. The great-grandson of Rabbi Hill, Gloria, the first rabbi of Brisk, and he wrote the commentary to the Shulchan Aruch for Ashkenazi. To this day, they have Jewish music playing in Warsaw, and there's a great revival of klezmer music, and there's, this is a concert of the klezmaniacs, the klezmer band, and they still play today in Krakow as an annual festival where non-Jews are playing Jewish music, it's quite bizarre, uh, in Poland like the Jews used to play for centuries before. Let's have a look at the great legacy of Polish Jewry. Rav Meir Shapiro Zatzal, the Rosh Hashim and Robert Lublin, the founder of the Daf Yomi movement. There are a number of us all over the world that have been learning and are learning in the Daf Yomi program. He raised funds for the construction of a new building for the Chachmei Lublin Yeshiva. 400 Talmudim started, and the entrance exam that you were tested about, you had to have knowledge of 200 Daf Gemara just to be admitted into the Yeshiva Chafir of the And it was unique for a person to be both a Rolf and a Rosh Yeshiva, as with the tells of Rolf, the laser wall. So there were certain individuals that were both the Rolf, the communal leader, the man that was reaching out to the entire community, and at the same time was the Rosh Yeshiva that was involved deeply in the learning of all the Rosh Yeshiva Yeshiva. And he died, unfortunately, at the age of 46. And this is the incredible building still standing to this day uh, in Lublin uh, during the Nazi occupation. The original yeshiva was established in 1515 and the city became known as the Jewish Oxford. The next great person that we know from, uh, from Poland, in fact he was from a place called Radin, which, is in, 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 which I visited and we visited with our group which is in Belarus today, but it was once in Poland. 
as I said, the Paul is moved by the sort of Vilna as well. Rabbi Shroh Malik Kagan Zatzal, the Chofetz Chaim, lived from 1838 to 1933, lived well into his 90s. And he was the one that, uh, when Rabbi Zubud was speaking a few minutes ago, Miha Isha Chofetz Chaim, Ohed Yamim Nirato. And he learned from there that if you want life, don't speak Loshon Hora. And to live to the age of something, I think it was 97. Is that right? 95. Uh, in between 1800 and the early 1900s, just shows that he was living testimony to what, for what he lived for. He was born in Jekyll, in Poland, in February 1838, and he died and buried in, and died and is buried in Rome in Lithuania. And he authored, as we know, the famous mission of Rura. So, as much as people think of him as a tzaddik, he was also an enormous giant in Torah and was a, was a codifier just like the Ramor, so he too was a codifier of the Shulchan Aruch. My own personal family history, Rav Moshe Rosenstein, uh, my son Yonatan Moshe is here tonight, he was named after Rav Moshe. He studied in the Tels Yeshiv of Lithuania, he was a Talmud of Rav Shimon Shkot and Rav Simcha Zissel Ziv in Kelms. He was the Mashiach of the Long Yeshiv in Poland. So this was a Jew, this was a Lithuanian Jew that learned in Tels, in the Musa schools of, of, of Lithuania, and then he went across and started the first Litvisha Yeshiva in Poland. And uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, modeled on the Litvish Yeshivas of, uh, with, together he built it with Rebbe Eliezer uh, in 1883. Sorry, Rebbe Eliezer built it in 1883, but Rav Moshe came across in the 1930s and introduced the Lithuanian learning. And the Rosh Yeshiva during his time was Rebbe Phil Mordechai Gordon, and he lived from 1880 to 1941. Then you had the huge Hasidic community uh, in Poland. And you had the famous Gera uh, and, and the place, what we call the Gera Hasidim, it's because the place was called Gora Kalavaria. Gora Kalavaria, Kalavaria became Gera. And you had the Fidusha Harim, the Yitzhak Mer Alta in the 1800s, the Swas Emes and the Imre Emes, a huge dynasty of Gera Hasidim who are today all over the world. And really to bring this right up to date, I thought I'd just put this insert into what is actually happening at the moment. For those that have been following the news, there's been a tremendous amount of publicity given to what the Polish government is doing today in 2018. The Polish government wanted to pass legislation that it was a crime to link the Poles with the Holocaust and to say that they were perpetrators of the Holocaust. We know Jews that just the knowledge that the, that the Nazis were coming to Poland gave license to the Poles to start murdering Jews wholesale. We know how the Poles stood idly by and allowed a place like Auschwitz to operate just outside of town. We know that Poles pointed out hundreds if not thousands of Jews and collaborated with the Nazis. But the Polish government in 2018 wants to say that they were all victims of Nazi fascism and I'm not denying that. There is a point to it that the Nazis did invade their country did subdue them and subjugate them, but there was an enormous amount of cooperation. In the countries where there was large cooperation, like Lithuania, Poland, Belarus, etc., 90% of the Jews were killed. Every country where there, was, where there was resistance, the percentage is gone. That we do know. But now the Polish government wants to criminalize anybody that dares to say that the Jews perpetrated, that the Polish perpetrated the Holocaust. For years, Polish officials have struggled to fight phrases like Polish death camps. In fact, I wrote an article which I sent to the Polish embassy because I wanted each ambassador to write a, a letter of introduction for me and I wanted to publish it. When the Polish embassy saw my caption of Poland, a Jewish graveyard, they went ballistic. And I never got an endorsement from them. And I didn't realize that. And it was only now in 2008, I sent my article about two or three years ago. I didn't realize how deep it was that they don't want anybody to say that all the Jews died in Poland. Two and a half million died in Auschwitz and a million died in Treblinka. Those are all places on Polish soil. But what they want to criminalize is they want to say, don't link it to Poland. Don't make it look like we were the perpetrators of the Holocaust. So they don't want things like Polish death camps to, they don't want people to refer to Polish death camps and um, they fear that as the war grows more distant, new generations will mistakenly come to believe that Poles 
were the perpetrators of the Holocaust. The law, however, has sparked a dispute with Israel where Holocaust survivors and officials fear its true aim is to repress research and debate about Poles who killed Jews during the war. And I can tell you there's a similar battle going on in Lithuania where the Lithuanians also want to revise history and they want to say that they were also uh, victims of the Holocaust just like the Jews and in fact they had the audacity to lay charges against two Jewish women partisans in, that are still alive in Vilna today and prosecute them for war crimes. That's how far this revisionism is. And that's why people at Yad Vashem and in, in the Knesset in Israel are fighting the Poles and saying, this is the beginning of trying to rewrite history and exonerate your role in the war in, and wiping out 90% of the Jews in your country. And we'll just conclude tonight with uh, just a, a little, a, a short analysis of uh, Belarus. As we saw, Belarus is on the, on the eastern side of Poland. This was a shul at the back. And what the Russians did was, all the shuls that remained after the Holocaust, they converted into music halls and schools, hospitals, etc., etc. So here, these poles, these, uh, uh, these columns, not poles, these columns, were built outside as a new facade. And it's an example of many buildings in Minsk and other places where they renovated them for their own purposes. So as we know, the Jews survived the Holocaust and in 1945 became subject to communist rule in Eastern Europe and throughout the Soviet Union. And the reason that our group was taken into these countries, and this was really in 96, which was also very early on uh, in, in the work of the, of the Jewish agency in these countries, and we were actually able to see Jews that were, it was beneath the radar, they didn't want the, the Gentiles, they didn't want the, the, the Belarusian uh, government to know, but this was a secret classroom that I was sitting in with these Jews from Minsk, and they had brought in a teacher that was teaching them Hebrew that was flown in from Israel to start educating these people. It was the biggest problem that we had in bringing back the Jews that had survived the Holocaust that were now under Soviet occupation, was that they were deprived of their Jewish education. No Hebrew. No prayer books, no filling, hardly any functioning shuls. There were one or two. There was the Archipova shul, for example, that I've been to in Moscow, where, where there were Jews that were allowed to, to govern, but generally they weren't. So you had to start from, from ground level. So what they did was they used to bring in young Israelis and other people that would get friendly with Jews in the street, and they would get friendly on a social level. They would invite them at social clubs with pool and other games, start conversations with these kids. And then some of them would confide in them <coughs> that they were actually Jews. Some of these Belarusians would confess that they were Jews and then afterwards they would get them into learning programs like what was happening in this classroom. And this over here, this guy with a striped shirt, was a Belarusian young man that had been brought in through that social network, brought them back to Yiddish tribe. He then eventually went on Aliyah and was in the army for three years as a Tzankhan. And then they sent these guys back to Belarusia so that these guys who are speaking Russian can then talk to their friends and encourage them also to come forward and to make Aliyah and eventually uh, leave these countries. <coughs> this was, this is a pit called Yama, which is in the center of Minsk in, in Belarus. 6,000 people are buried in this particular pit, right in the city center of Minsk. And this guy here is an incredible guy. Uh, Nay Bruderman, uh, our group was introduced to him, and these are also the most incredible things that when you go back to these countries, and I think you have to go in a way where you can, where you connect it with, with people like this. Nay Bruderman was brought up in a communist home in Russia, and he used to spy on his parents. The Russian schools used to tell their children to say what was happening at home, and he thought it was inverted commas and mitzvah to say what his parents were doing with the poor. Can you imagine that? Your own children in your own home are spying on you and telling the KGB about what's going on in your home. That was Leib Ruderman, until he got to a certain point where his father, now can you imagine walking this path up that you know your kid is reporting you to the KGB, but you have to try and say to him in some way, they are the enemy, I am your family, we are proud Jews, you can't be reporting on us. He managed slowly to turn Leib around. Leib himself then went to Israel, educated himself, and has spent his whole life and has been responsible for 30,000 Jews, 
leaving Belarus, Belarusia and going on there. <coughs> right next to Yamara, you see over here some of the original houses occupied by Jews. This is very typical of a shtetl house that you would find throughout Lithuania, and you found it here in Belarus as well. These are the kind of homes that our grandparents, great grandparents used to live in. Some of them are still standing. This is a Jewish graveyard in Minsk, which today is a park. Another famous lady that came out of Poland that we have to mention tonight, and we've just got a few minutes before we end, Sarah Schlera, born in Krakow, Poland, born into a Hasidic family, educated in a Polish public school, worked for as part of her life as a seamstress. 1914, they went to Vienna in Austria, and she saw the need to educate Jewish kids. So just now we were talking about educating kids under communism. Here was a woman that woke up and said, hang on a second, Jews in Poland, Jewish women in Poland are not getting a Jewish education. And with the blessing of the Bells already, she opened a school and a library for Jewish girls in Krakow in 1918. She named it Base Yaakov. Initially, there were 25 students and it grew into an impressive educational network. By the time of the passing, there were 200 schools attended by 25,000 students all over Eastern and Central Europe. Another giant that came out of Poland, 1883 to 1935. The Jew is the emblem of eternity. He who neither slaughter nor torture of thousands of years could destroy. He who neither fire nor sword nor inquisition was able to wipe off the face of the earth. He who was the first to produce the oracles of God. He who has been for so long the guardian of prophecy and has transmitted it to the rest of the world. Such a nation cannot be destroyed. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, in the short time that we've had together, that we've touched on that eternal spark of the Jew. How we've risen. What we've done in the world. How under the most incredible circumstances we have come through. We've held on to that precious, precious heritage. And please God, all of us should have the strength and the wisdom to continue with that heritage until the coming of Mashiach. Who said this? The Jew is as everlasting as eternity itself. A non-Jew. Leo Nikolaevich Tolstoy said that in 1908. Thank you very much. Hereafter, not only for tonight, but to him and his family for their tremendous contribution to our community. And thank you for always being the ultimate team player. Big Shakar, very informative and very well done. Tomorrow morning, Shakris will be at 8.30.